Hey, Aaron, thanks so much for your time. So give us uh, more details of what Njikalana say, said he saw. Well, this is fundamental to the work of this inquest. Um, important to note that he says he didn't disclose this information in 1982 because he knew the consequences of ratting out effectively on the security branch. He knew what they were capable of, and they were all sitting in the courtroom in 1982. But what's so critical here is that he says he was awoken in his cell on the second floor of John Forster Square uh, the night of the 4th of February 1982 or the morning of the 5th of February 1982. Mm. We were told... Agate died on the 5th mm. and he heard a noise, the jangle of a gate being opened. He heard hushed voices, which was unusual. Sometimes they would open gates to check on people, but the voices were strange. Then he stood on top of a toilet seat, he says, peered over and for a glimmer of a moment, he saw Neil Agate's prone bar body being carried by four to six security branch members. Here's just some of that evidence mm. from earlier today. I saw Neil being carried through. Uh, he was carried face up, uh, if I can use uh, an example, it's uh, the way Muslims carry their dead, that's how it was carried. I see. And, and for the court's benefit, can you describe how you would understand how Muslims would carry their dead? Well, they carry their dead shoulder high. Shoulder high. So, Aaron, we also heard today from Feroz Kachalia. What did he have to say about uh, Neil Agat's condition? Well, Kachalia says the first and last time he met Neil Agat in person was almost in passing in John Forster Square. Detainees weren't really allowed to talk to one another. They could maybe make a simple greeting, but no substantial discussion. Uh, and he spoke about Agat's condition some time before he died. I think it was sort of the beginnings of 1982, so just, just a few weeks, if not a month before his death. Uh, this is the condition he saw Agat in. I think it was sometime in, in January, it was in my second or third round of uh, uh, detention and uh, one morning, um, as was usual, I was fetched, uh, uh, taken through the, the charge office and on that occasion, um, to, when we were being booked out uh, to be taken to the 10th floor, uh, uh, Comrade Neil Agat was uh, was in that office at the same time. Um, and um, he, he struck me um, as, as a person, as I said, a uh, very gentle person. Uh, but uh, he, he seemed to me to be um, having taken a lot of strain. Um, and I worried about him, actually. Uh, I just worried that, that he, he, he... Because I also knew, you know, what, what I was experiencing on the 10th floor. Um, and I remember being struck... I was forcibly struck by the sense that... He, he was in a lot of trouble. So, Yveka, what also came out of Kachalia's evidence was really what I saw as survivor's guilt. He got very worked mm. up, uh, his eyes bristling with tears at you a You can point. feel that coming from him, yeah. You can, yeah. And, and it was when he was describing knowing if you were in detention on the second floor uh, that if you hadn't been called for interrogation and torture that day, your peer, your comrade, someone you knew through the trade unions or through ANC circles was going through mm. the exact same brutality you had experienced. So there was the relief, but there was also that grim knowledge of what others were going through. And then living with that for all of these years till now. Uh, Aaron, another witness, Maurice Smithers, describing what happened after he witnessed Agat's torture before his death. Tell us more about that quickly. So Smithers was actually first today, and it was a short session just concluding his evidence yesterday. Mm. He'd witnessed en route to go and see an optician about his glasses, um, Agat being tortured. He was actually held at Randburg police cells, but en route to this optician, he was held at John Forster. And he he says through a glass partition he could see silhouettes and he saw Agate being forced to do different physical activities, running on the spot, running on the spot mm. with his knees mm. high, forced down onto the ground and seemingly told to do push-ups. At some point he says he heard the sound of flesh being smacked and this was after he'd seen a security branch member moving around at the waist so he deduced it was a belt that was being used on Agate. Smithers says that he then saw Agate's silhouette bend down 
first in one motion and then another. And this made him deduce that Agatha had in fact been naked this entire session and was then after it concluded pulling up his uh, underpants and then his trousers. He was then taken back to Randburg prison cells and was so distressed by what he'd witnessed that he then in solitary confinement forced himself to do the same physical exercises, not only to sort of purge the pain of what mm. he'd seen, mm happened to someone he knew but also to just see if he could handle it physically and Smithers actually wrote a letter he hid inside a matchbox and was able to smuggle out of prison and get to his sister who ingeniously sent it to Helen Sussman mm. who then read it out in Parliament in 1982. Wow. All right Erin Bates I don't know how you sit through all of this just like I don't know how you know these men and women yes, we've yes. heard testify have had to live with this for all of these years and what they saw and experienced themselves thanks very much for that Erin Bates. Thanks.